he was younger and I believe that he became more vicious and more aggressive as uh, time went on. I don't know how much of Jimmy Dolan's behavior reflects Lawrence Murphy and how much of it is just pure Jimmy Dolan. A staunch ally of Murphy and Dolan's was the Lincoln County Sheriff William Brady. An Irish immigrant who came to America at age 20, Brady served in the Army for many years and attained the rank of Major when he mustered out after the Civil War in 1866. Brady had met L.G. Murphy when both were in the Army. It was during his time in military service at Fort Stanton that Brady was introduced to Lincoln County. And after his discharge, he homesteaded a farm about five miles east of the town of Lincoln. Over the next decade, Brady became one of Lincoln's leading citizens, serving the town and the county in various official capacities. Brady's close association with Murphy led him to favor the Murphy Dolan interests in his capacity as the county sheriff. When the troubles began in Lincoln County in late 1877, William Brady was 48 years old. He would not live to see his 49th birthday. Englishman John Henry Tunstall arrived in Lincoln in 1876. He had come to the American West to make his fortune. With his family's money behind him, Tunstall had visions of building a financial empire in Lincoln. On the outside, the 24-year-old Tunstall seemed friendly, open, and very sincere. However, his refined exterior hid well his driving passion to become a wealthy man. His goal was simple to replace Dolan and company as the monopolizing force in Lincoln's economy. I would raise a question here that hits me a lot of times. What is wrong with this driving desire to be a businessman? We hit Murphy and Dolan and Tunstall all with, we've got stereotypes, they're greedy men, they're all, they're just Americans, they want to make money, and they've got to. Uh, I agree, I think Tunstall was um, uh, in it for the money. I think he wanted to replace the other ring with his own ring. And I think that he uh, did not realize that he was up against a group of guys who would play rough. He, uh, Tunstall uh, was under the idea that he could work this out legally. Big mistake. Certainly. Tunstall uh, stated that he wanted to make, in letters back home, that he wanted to make 50 cents on every dollar made in the county. What would you call the motivating force there? The motivating force is greed. There's no difference there between L.G. Murphy and J.J. Dolan and, and uh, John Henry Tunstall. Where he really blew it is that he totally underestimated the, the lengths and the, the uh, resources available to Murphy and Dolan. I mean, I don't think he ever realized he was taking on the Santa Fe Ring. Tunstall's ally in Lincoln was the town's only lawyer, Scotsman Alexander McSween, who had helped convince Tunstall to seek his fortune in Lincoln. The Englishman began his quest by acquiring a large tract of land for a cattle ranch approximately 50 miles south of Lincoln on the banks of the Rio Feliz River. It was in 1877 that Tunstall opened his store and bank in town, which was, of course, in direct competition with the Dolan Company. It was inevitable that the two sides would clash. Early on, however, it seems neither Tunstall nor McSween realized it would become a life and death struggle. The only person who was fully aware of the ominous circumstances that were developing was McSween's wife, Susan McSween. Mr. McSween met Mr. Tunstall at the Herlow Hotel in Santa Fe in October of 1876. They got along well immediately. I told Tunstall and Mr. McSween that they would be murdered if they went into the store business. I did my best to keep McSween from entering the business, but he went against my will. Tunstall was the cause of his getting into it. Susan McSween, White Oaks, New Mexico. Tunstall probably didn't realize exactly what he was getting into, but Tunstall was a very bright young man. But he was also um, very aggressive. He was a good businessman. He was very intelligent in that he didn't let all the people know that he was dealing with. He didn't let them know really what he was after. But he did say, you know, that he would have 50 cents out of every dollar that was made here in Lincoln County. And there were other stores here besides the house and John Tunstall. And where did that leave all of the little people? So that should have given them some hint at, at what he could be. I think in a way he was worse than Murphy because he really did seem to be deceiving people. Most of the Hispanic and Anglo farmers here, you know, they felt that Tunstall was 
you know, a breath of fresh air, he's going to save them from the house when in fact he simply wanted to replace the house. I think uh, one of the things that isn't brought out in this whole war is the fact that it wasn't just a war about merchants, as is always portrayed, but it was a war about class, and it was a war about religion, Roman Catholics against Protestants, and I think most importantly, both Tunstall and McSween were frontier yuppies. They thought that they knew everything, and they thought they were up against these low-class Irish cutthroats. That's how they portrayed them, and they were in for a rude awakening. Many historians believe that Henry McCarty, later known as Billy the Kid, was born in New York City in either the fall or winter of 1859. Despite many years of research, historians have been unable to pinpoint his exact birth date. His mother was an Irish immigrant named Catherine McCarty, who claimed to be married to a man named Michael McCarty. Whether or not they were actually married is uncertain. What is certain is that in the mid-1860s, Catherine moved west with her two sons, Henry and Joe, to Indianapolis, Indiana. It was in Indiana that she met a man named William Antrim, who was 13 years her junior. In 1870, she moved with Antrim and her two sons to Wichita, Kansas. And from here, they moved further west, first to Denver and then to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where Antrim and Catherine were married in 1873. Later that same year, the family settled in Silver City, New Mexico. Here, Antrim worked at odd jobs while trying to strike it rich in the silver mines, and Catherine took in boarders to help make ends meet. With both parents working constantly, young Henry McCarty had little adult supervision, and had even less when his mother died of tuberculosis in 1874. One of young Henry's first crimes came in 1875, when, at age 16, he hid clothes that had been stolen from a Chinese laundry. It was not a serious crime, but upon his capture, Henry was put in the Silver City Jail. He was not, however, held in a cell. Instead, he had the run of the jailhouse corridor. Showing a daring and cunning that would serve him well in years to come, Henry escaped by climbing up the chimney. How Henry spent the next two years of his life is a question historians have been trying to answer for years. In the late 1870s, however, Henry, now known as Kid Antrim, turned up at Camp Grant, Arizona. Here, the teenager would turn to a life of crime and commit his first murder, when in a barroom fight, he gut shot and killed a local blacksmith named Wendy Cahill. Billy fled Arizona and arrived in Lincoln County, New Mexico in the fall of 1877 as a member of the Jesse Evans Outlaw Gang. Evans was a rustler and a murderer who terrorized much of the central and southern New Mexican territory. What's more, he was an ally of James Dolan. Shortly after Billy's arrival in Lincoln, Billy left the Evans gang and signed on as a hired hand with John Tunstall. Although there is no record of the kid and Tunstall spending much time together, young Billy did admire the sophisticated and refined Englishman. Billy was hired on as a Tunstall hand by young Richard Brewer. Brewer had a ranch of his own, but also worked as Tunstall's foreman on the Rio Feliz spread. Frank Coe, who also worked for Tunstall and was a good friend of the kids, remembers the teenage Billy who rode into Lincoln County that fateful autumn of 1877. Billy weighed about 125 pounds and was 5 feet 7 inches tall and as straight as an arrow. The kid had beautiful hazel eyes. Those eyes, so quick and so piercing, were what saved his life many a time. He never seemed to care for money, except to buy cartridges with. Cartridges were scarce, and he always used 10 times as many as anyone else. My cousin George always talked about how much Billy liked to sing and dance. Well, I've ridden weary miles with Billy, and I've played the fiddle when he danced, while a sergeant and a deputy sat in a room with orders to bring him in dead or alive. That was Billy, all right. Frank Coe, San Patricio, New Mexico. We have here in New Mexico a, a Franciscan priest who's a historian, and he wrote an introduction to a book he wrote on Padre Martinez of Taos that has this marvelous opening sentence, which I think fits Billy the Kid to a T. And he says that what makes a man or a woman long remembered on history's stage, even if it's only on the local scene, is sheer personality. I think Billy the Kid 
uh, did have two sides. I, I think the, uh, the evidence clearly indicates that he could kill without remorse. And